Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you actually face to face. Uh, as you know, we were not here last week. Um, we were in isolation uh, due to one of our daughters having COVID. Uh, we never got it, but we're all out of isolation and uh, all back to be together. Thank you, Johan, for your message last Sunday. Very much appreciate that for stepping in, uh, and we were all blessed by that. And um, thank you to the AV team. Those guys do an amazing job. Um, it, it almost, almost feels like you're there when you're in your living room um, with the, uh, the, the presentation. Um, and I don't know, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing if you have a legitimate reason to be at home. Um, isolation, uh, sickness, uh, health reasons. Um, but if you are at home and you have no good reason, we want you to be here. Okay, uh, I mean, that's sort of a bit of a pressure there, but um, you're going to miss out. Uh, it is so important to be gathered together personally in the body of Christ, and we know so many of you know that as well, and, uh, and if you, so uh, those who are here, thank you for coming. Those who are joining us on screen, thank you as well, uh, and get to know each other afterwards. Uh, we've got tea and coffee time uh, there, so spend a bit of time fellowshipping one with another. Um, we are continuing on uh, with our sermon series in the book of Proverbs. It's a little bit staggered at the moment. Uh, we started, we stopped last week, we started again, uh, and we will have a break next week because we've got uh, Andrew with us, and then we'll be back right through to Easter. So, uh, Lord willing, who knows? Uh, so, if you'd like to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, and we will read from verses 8 through to verse 19. And follow along as I read. We always encourage you, while it's on the screen, to have your own Bible with you so you can follow along as we exegete the text uh, in a moment. So, the Word of God says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us live in or let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your feet from their paths. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. That is the word of the living God. Let us commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and our everlasting God, Jesus, when you saved us, you did not immediately call us, call us home. You saved us to live as salt and light in this world. Our Lord, in this darkened, wicked world, uh, to show the beauty and majesty and goodness of Christ. Uh, Lord, but we know as we walk this path called life, there are voices seeking to pull us off down other paths that are not fun, that will end in destruction. And Lord, we pray that we would heed the voice of Christ this day. We are a needy people, so easily distracted. Help us, Lord, by the Holy Spirit to Tune our mind to what you have to say to us this day in your word, that we would live a God-honoring life for Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Whose voice will you listen to? Whose voice will you listen to? This is the question that beset Adam and Eve when they were placed in the Garden of Eden. In a very real situation, with a very real command, with very real results, if they fail to listen to the voice. Will they listen to God, 
or will they listen to the serpent? Will they listen to God who wisely designed the world with all its physical, ethical, moral um, laws and structures whose outcome is assured? God created it. He knows the end. He knows the road to blessing. Or will they follow the serpent who will lie and who goes against the grain of God's path, God's law, God's ethics, God's moral commands, and try to persuade them down another road that cannot but end in destruction? This was not a theoretical question for Adam and Eve. It wasn't theoretical results. Real question, a real path to walk down that will ultimately end in real results, and we know the results for ourselves, don't we? Whose voice will you listen to? Wisdom pays attention to the realities of life and humbly yields to God's design and God's purpose and God's plans. It's no wonder Solomon when he outlined at the very start that we read, uh, that we preached on uh, two weeks ago, that the fear of the Lord, God's designs, God's purposes, God's plans, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. God knows. He knows what we need. He knows the right path. However, unlike the wise, the fool cuts across the grain of God's design, God's purposes, God's plans, and foolishly hopes for a positive outcome. It just doesn't work. And look, we see with such sadness and sorrow what is happening before our very eyes in this this culture now. Things are being taught, laws are being passed, people are making irreversible choices that we know will end tragically because the outcome is against God, or the, the, the design is against God's design. It just can't work. And it's reaching, I think, epic proportions, which is having and will have devastating results. No matter how much you despise gravity, no matter how you wish gravity would just go away. Be assured, if you jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute, you will not live. No matter how much you don't like God, or his plans, or his purposes, or his designs, if you cut across them, the outcome's assured, beloved. You can't win. One man said it like this, sin is trying to succeed by ignoring reality. The sinner is trying in vain to re-engineer God's design his own way. And sometimes we know as we're living in this life that choices don't always seem to be black and white. It's hard to navigate, isn't it? But this is why God's given us the book of Proverbs, that we would have wisdom for living, that we would have wisdom to know how to live successfully for God and under God. That's what we're doing here. And in Proverbs 1, 8 to 19, two voices are present, and both are vying for the son's attention. The voice of wisdom through a loving father, or the voice of folly through sinners. The Father promises that wisdom will make him truly beautiful, while the sinner's promises of riches and belonging are counterfeit and will end up making him sad, ugly, and will end up leading to physical destruction in this life and spiritual destruction in the next and so the question we come to or have to, have to answer as we come to this text is, whose voice will you listen to? The voice of wisdom that humbly yields to God's design and takes you down the path of beauty and joy, though difficult often, but will lead to life, or the voice of 
The sinner who will take it, you down the path of destruction, despondency, of guilt, a guilt-ridden life that does lead to death. Two voices, two paths, ending in two very, very different destinations. Whose voice will you listen to this morning? Before we answer that question, or before we lay out the two voices, I want to remind you of the structure of Proverbs, because we come to Proverbs and we think, what is this? It seems like just a hodgepodge of wisdom given. Well, in fact, there is an a structure to it, verses 1 to 7 really lay out for you, it's like a mini introduction, the preamble. It states the purpose of the book. The purpose is to grant us wisdom, that we would have it and walk in it. Uh, how might we do this? The main theme is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, verse 7. Then we go from the preamble really to the mega introduction, the prologue and epilogue, which takes us from verses 8, chapter 1, through the end of chapter 9. Okay, so this is now, and it's really 10 lectures, two from the father to the son, and also two um, speeches from Lady Wisdom uh, to the son also. And what it's really saying is, this is why you need to live uh, in a wise way. That basically, Solomon the father is convincing the son and us, there's good reason to live in wisdom. And then Chapter 10 right through to 31 is a mixture of Proverbs that's, that now apply all the reasons for living in wisdom. And so we're going to look at, really in a systematic way, through to chapter 9, and then we're going to pick up themes after that. Approximately 20 sermons taking us through to July. So that's just the road, the path, and to help you structure Proverbs. But we come to this portion. Whose voice will you listen to? The voice of wisdom, first of all, if you'd like to put that up. It says this in verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. I want you to see, first of all, the place where this wisdom is granted, or where this call is granted. Now, the Old Testament saint uh, is... Um, for the Old Testament saint, the father represents God the Father, who is giving wisdom to... The families of Israel. So it's like the Father is speaking into the families of Israel. For the New Testament, it is God the Father granting us wisdom as his children in his church. For us as people who desire wisdom. But I don't want you to dismiss the family setting presented in these two verses. Here you have the, the Father leading the family, backed up by the mother who is endorsing the father's wisdom, and it's her own as well, father and mother, with the son who is there as one who is there to seek wisdom. It's not done in the courtroom. It's not done in the lecture room, sit down and listen to my wisdom. It's done in the family room, a place of love and nurture. This is where wisdom is given and received. But not only the place, look at the posture of both the teller and learner. You get the feeling that the father is not treating the son as, a, as one of the fools. Sit down and listen to me. He's treating the son with dignity as one of the wise men who is leaning in to the father saying, give me wisdom as I start the progress of life. As I move from um, childhood to adulthood, there is honor. There is a willing spirit. I don't see the son here um, as the father comes and says, sit down. I'd like to share this. I don't want to hear. No, no, no. I don't want to hear anything. I know my own path. I know my own way. Not that lecture again. That's not what we see. We see a father, mother, loving, caring for their children, their child, and the son really wanting to listen really wanting to listen. That's the posture. And notice the preparation here that the father is giving. The father, as he looks at his son, as if straight in the eye. Son, he says, I want to tell you about the world we live in. The world that you will live in every day of your life, so you are not taken unawares. 
Here is what you need to expect and here is what you need to navigate the course of life. That's a father taking up his responsibility to his son. He doesn't, I mean, let's be serious, as, uh, children, as, sorry, as parents, parenthood is tough. It's difficult. You need wisdom. But notice the father doesn't put boundaries around his family, impenetrable boundary, boundaries to hold out the world. As if kind of this fear in whatever will happen. Nor does the father release the son into the world. I call that roll in the dice parenting. You know what? What can I do? I've tried. Now I just release the son into the world. That's not what he's doing either. Without boundaries? No. No, what he does, he is a parent who prepares his son for the realities that are going to face this son in the world. This is wise parenting. This is courageous parenting. This is parenting that will not let the world take over the son, but wisdom to take the son and to prepare the son for whatever might come in the world. This is not exposing the son to a bad movie. Sit down and let's watch what this, how terrible this world is. No, this is saying, remember we talked about this last time. It's not so much we live and learn as it is we learn then live. This is what I want to tell you, son. This is what you're going to expect. This is the world we live in and this is how to navigate well in this world. And you might be one who does not have a father or a mother with such love, such courage, such wisdom. Now you might be one who actually doesn't have a saved father that could speak this sort of wisdom into your life. You might have not have a father at all who's around. And you say, what do I do? Well, the beauty is that God the Father has put you and me into a family called the community of Christ. This is what we're here for. We are a family of God being built up one to another for the good of Christ, for his glory. And we are, in a sense, spiritual parents one to another. The father here is not so much saying to the son as a biological father, uphold my name, as he is a spiritual father leading him in the paths of righteousness. And as I look around here, I see many, many spiritual fathers and mothers who are already investing into the lives of not their biological children, but the children of faith who are under them and who are with them. Isn't this sort of what we see in the New Testament as well? Timothy, it would seem, did not have a saved father. He was Greek, probably, but not able to give the wisdom that is required. And so Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Mothers, what a responsibility you have to invest wisdom into your children, even if your husband is not around or unsaved. But you don't have to do it alone either, because the very nature of Paul's relationship with Timothy showed that he was a spiritual father of Timothy. He was leading him. He was guiding him. He was in the community of faith. And Paul also tells Titus uh, in the book of Titus, he encourages this kind of spiritual parenting model. Doesn't he say to Titus in Titus 1.4, older women are to teach what is good and so train the young women. That's not their own biological children, but it's their spiritual children. Um, Titus 2.6, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, as Titus, as a, a spiritual parent, urges the younger men. We are in the family of God being granted the opportunity to invest wisdom into one another. That's why we're having, in one sense, the uh, discipleship class at the equip class that I'd really encourage you to come to. It is spiritual parenting. 
It is being a disciple of someone and discipling others. It's just investing wisdom into each other's lives as we walk this journey together. This is in one sense why we, um, I don't know whether you get fed up, but when you come in, there's someone checking your name off. Do you know why they do that? It's not to keep a track of you because what, in one sense, we believe that your presence here is a somewhat of a barometer of where you're at. And we believe it's important for you to be in the house of God. And so as, as carers and shepherds as, of, of you, we want to be able to reach out if for some reason you're away from the house of God for a certain period of time. So, just, so we, we understand the necessity to live in the family of God. What will be the benefit of this sort of living? Well, the Father tells us this. He says why we ought to listen to wisdom's voice. What will it profit us? There are many reasons to listen to wisdom's voice. But one he gives here is that it makes us beautiful. It makes us attractive. Listen to this. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Look at the imagery. It was an imagery that certainly was understood in those times. A graceful garland symbolizes a victor's wreath. In Proverbs 4.9, it's a beautiful crown. The pendant for your neck is the mark of prestige and honor. A gold medal that is placed around the neck of the winner in the, in the Olympics. It is to say that if you live in this way, you are beautiful and you are attractive. Paul tells us where this ultimate beauty comes from. He doesn't so much say to put on wisdom, though he could. But who is wisdom? It's Jesus. So Paul in Romans 13 says, put now on Christ. Put on Jesus Christ, who is himself wisdom. By faith, live in the spirit, abide in Christ. Not in your self-serving ways, but in Christ. Isn't there something beautiful about Jesus? Isn't there something beautiful that he would get up from the table as everyone's looking at the dusty feet, wishing the servant would come and wash their feet? He gets up and washes their own feet, even Judas's. Something beautiful about that, isn't there? There's something very appealing about Jesus as he speaks to the woman by the well, not in a condemning way, and not in a way as if to take advantage of her, but a way that would reach into her blackened soul and give her hope. There is something very attractive about that sort of person. There is something very attractive in the way Jesus spoke. He spoke words of grace. Even when he went back to his hometown in Nazareth, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? And yet, they said, he spoke, they spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth, Luke 4.22. Even the soldiers that went to arrest him said, we can't arrest him. No one's ever spoken like this. There is something very alluring about Jesus who would give up his sleep and go before his father in prayer, who would sit among sinners in the hope of receiving the lost sheep, who would even forgive his accusers. Peter says, this sort of adorning is very precious in God's sight. We want to be around Jesus-like sort of people. Not self-focused, not narcissistic, Jesus sort of people. It's very, very attractive. And so wisdom makes us beautiful. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Whose voice will you listen to? The voice of wisdom is very beautiful. It makes you really nice and really nice to be with. But then there is another voice calling for your attention and calling for the son's attention. And the father doesn't dismiss it, is called the voice of sinners in verses 10 to 19. He says this, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. This is to say, son, sinners always want company. And when 
they entice you to join with them in their sin, you must be prepared to give the response. You must have your speech ready and prepared. And it goes something like this. No. Very simple. No. No questions, no deliberations. If sinners entice you, do not consent. Back in the 80s, there was a campaign against drugs and it was put forward by Nancy Reagan with the simple slogan, just say no, just say no. This is the counsel of the Father. I'm not doing that, no. Now, the Father could, at this point, just stop right there. This is wisdom. This is a beautiful garland. If sinners entice you, say no. Now, son, let's get on to the next lesson. He doesn't do that, and so often we do. Don't do that, son. Don't do that, daughter. But he treats them, the father treats the son with great care and respect as the father, as the heavenly father does to us and engages the son's mind as as the father now is engaging your mind to say no, and this is why. Because we now want to see the results of this sort of voice if we go down this road. And so a number of things I want to show you here is the sinner's desire. So who are these sinners? Because the Bible tells that we're all sinners. Notice this, if sinners entice you, well, we're all sinners. But see, this is a special breed of sinner, if there is such a thing. The Father describes them as those who live their life caring only for themselves. And by doing so, they unashamedly exploit others and recruit the gullible to carry out their work. In verse 19, it's a, it's a broad view. It just simply says, everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. These are self-serving people who are only interested in using you for their own gains. Whether it be for money, power, prominence, prosperity, Such people come in all sorts of forms, in all areas of life. It could be the politician who is giving money to the the people that he knows will vote for them and not giving money to those who he knows will not vote for them. Call that pork barreling. (laughs) What about so-called people who pressure you to do something, wear something, say something and and you know that it's wrong because they are wanting company in their wrongdoing. What about the boyfriend who pressures you saying, come on, everyone's doing it. It's no big deal. If you love me, you would do it. What about the bully at school who lures you into joining, ganging up on the kid who no one likes? could be in the workplace. I remember in grade four, I changed school and I was eager for friends. And it was the end of grade four and then early in grade five, these two cool kids came to me. I was like nine years old. Came to me and said, see that kid over there? No one likes him. You want to get him? And I thought, if it means going in with you guys, yeah, let's get that guy. Don't even know him. Yeah, let's get him after school. And so here I am waiting for him to come out of class, thinking that these kids are around, these two guys. He comes out and I hit him straight in the face. What was I thinking? He had to have dental work. His parents came and I got into a load of trouble. Where were these kids? Did that help win friends and influence others? No. I was drawn into sin, believing the benefits were good for me. I would be in cahoots with the popular guys. What about the false teacher who gives you messages to itch your ears? Peter says to be wary of of those in 2 Peter 2.3 if in their greed they exploit you with their false words. What about gossips who bring down the reputation of others by saying, I haven't told anyone, I'm bringing you into my confidence. I'm only saying this to you. 
when you listen to them, you've consented. This is how church splits start. What you need to say is, no, if you've got an issue with that person, you go and speak to that person. Because I'm not hearing it. See, the sinner's desire is for you to join their sin and ultimately exploit you. The sinner's deliberations, let's have a look at that. There are many ways this voice, the, the voice of sinner's Um, comes to us, but the Father, I love how he does this, brilliantly condemns them and exposes them. See, they would never talk like this, but if you were to listen behind the scenes, this is what they want. Let's have a listen. Come with us. Let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. See, when the voice of sinners comes, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds so reasonable, so sort of caring for me. You know, do this and you'll be part of me. So innocent. The Proverbs 18, 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Let us... Let us right this wrong that they've done. We've got to bring justice. Everyone is doing it. You don't don't want to be left out. Your parents don't know. Look, telling your spouse is probably not a wise thing. Doesn't feel like we are being ambushed in innocent blood. And look at the, the benefits are so tempting. But they are utterly counterfeit, counterfeit wealth. Verse 13, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. We will get security. We'll get money. We'll get, it'll make us feel good. We'll get love. He'll love me. It'll vindicate my name. It'll bring justice to that guy who's done wrong and no one knows it. Have you ever had that feeling of envy or resentment deep inside of you? If you do, be very wary because you are waiting for blood. It only takes someone to come along and fuel that and you will ambush them and take them down with words of uh, vindictiveness. What about a counterfeit community? Counterfeit wealth, counterfeit community. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. Is this the purse you want? We all like the sense of community, but community built around sin is counterfeit. Because the very nature of community is never self-serving. True community, true love, true marriage is always others-centered. Community built around sin is never going to last. One commentator says, Whenever we gather around grievance rather than Jesus, that is counterfeit community, black market relationships, and that negatively... Or the, and that negativity is on a collision course with reality. It cannot succeed long term. How long will that community last? Not long. If the sun or any of us don't think too deeply about this, it seems so right, so enticing. But all it takes is for us to engage our mind a little to see what's going on. To see where the pathway, pathway leads, because it says that. Where does this pathway lead? To des- uh, where's the designation? Because they run counter to God's design, counter to his purposes, and counter to his plans, the end must be ruined. You cannot sin and get away with it. In a bid to feather their own nest by their sinful action, their own nest goes up in flames. And the father calls out and says, verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way of them, Hold back your foot from their paths. Before you take one more step on that path, I just want to show you quickly the outcome of that path. Just hold up. Stop. I want to show you what happens with their exploits. When they have an open disregard to godliness, when they do these things, it is like invisible coils being wrapped around them. You don't see it. But give it time. And those coils will choke the very life out of that person. I've lived long enough to see it happen to so many people. 
When you're young, it looks like everyone's getting away with everything. Just give it time. Verse, four, verse 16, 15, uh, 16. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Quite humorous, isn't it? Basically, he's saying, do you ever put a net in front of a bird? No, even a stupid bird will know that their net is there to get them. But these guys, by their deliberations to try and net someone else, they net themselves. I don't know if they're a cartoon of the roadrunner and the coyote. Is that still going? But remember, the coyote is always set in nets and traps for the roadrunner, but never gets him. It always falls back on himself. This is the same with this. They think they're actually destroying the victim, but they're destroying themselves in the long run. The wise son is able to deconstruct their words to say, no, that is wrong, that is bad, that is going to lead to destruction. I am not doing that. The very fact that Proverbs deals, it's interesting, deals with this right away shows that we are social people and want to be around people. And they have a lot of pull over our lives to take us away. Now, for here, it's like the young Jewish man leaving his own town to go into another town for work. And the, the father's saying, watch when you leave, be careful. It might be the young uh, man or boy or girl who's going off to university and just saying, be careful. Watch, because your, your influence, your influence, we're social people, we want belonging. And in our gullibility, we can listen to foolish voices and begin to step on destructive paths. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 13, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The Heavenly Father is calling to His children today and saying the very same thing. If sinners entice you, do not consent. Two voices, two paths, two destinations. One ends in life, one ends in death. Which one will you choose? That's the call today. And you might be here and you might say, Craig, I know what you're saying, but I chose long, away, long ago that path that leads to destruction. I've got secret sins that you know nothing of. Um, I am now bearing the brunt of those sins and I do not know how to get out of that. I feel guilt-ridden. I can see at the end I have no way out I don't know what to do. And there is a third voice, and that is the voice of Jesus. See, in your pain and in your guilt and in your confusion, Jesus is crying to you right now. He is calling out. He is the wisdom. And he is coming to you and calling you out of your sin and rebellion. You know you've sinned and rebelled against Jesus. You know that if he was to judge you now, he would judge you guilty and that's not good. You know that. But listen, Jesus, he should, but he's not standing, lying in ambush, waiting for your blood. He gave up his own blood so that he would save your soul. So that you would not deal with your sins, that he would deal with them. He has taken every form of guilt, every form of shame, every sin that you've ever committed, he laid them on himself. So that you could get off the path that you're going down and get on the path with Jesus. He did not come to pillage and destroy. He did not come making false promises of prosperity and counterfeit promises of community, uniting around self-serving dreams. Rather, he came to give you life, true life, life where there is no burden, no guilt, no broken hopes and dreams, no fleeting pleasures for a time, but to grant you a kingdom and to put you in a community of love and care and compassion and to put you on a road that leads to joy and happiness, that is beautiful. And you might feel ugly right now. He makes the ugly beautiful. 
He gave himself for you. And you, and he's calling in the words of the Father, come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is the gospel. And you say, I've got nothing to give. I've only got sin. That's the point. Come to me. Lay your burden of sin at his feet. Humbly receive his life. I don't know how to live like that. You don't need to because he lives in you and through you. All you've got to do is humble yourself and admit, Lord, I've rebelled against you. I need you. And this path I'm leading is going to be a path that will lead to ruin. I need you. And he promises to come to you, to forgive you, and to even clean up your pathetic life and my pathetic life and to put you on a track. There is no friend like Jesus. No friend like Jesus. He is all you need and his offer is before you now. The path of sin that leads to destruction or the path of Jesus. Two voices. Two paths. Two destinations. Which one are you going to choose? Let us pray. Lord, thank you. None of us are deserving of any of this. Lord, we have rebelled against you a thousand times, ten thousand times. And Lord, you did not leave us in our sin. Even for the one who is still turning their back on you, you are still calling. And Lord, we can hear the voice of sinners. We know it's not a voice of love. They only want to serve their, their own selves. We know their path is destruction. We know their end will not end well. But then there is the voice of Jesus, who is the voice of love, the voice of care, the one who would leave the realms of glory, live a perfect life and die for the sinner, die for the rebel. That's not fair. And that we would receive you. And that justice would be met at the cross in Christ. Lord, I pray, wherever we are on the scale of salvation, whether we've been saved for many years or whether we are not even saved, Lord, would we heed the voice of Jesus? Would we love you more than anything? Lord, a life of love in Christ is the greatest inoculation against any sinner's voice. Would we love Jesus above every other thing, person in this life? And Lord, help us to live a life that honors you. Thank you, Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen.